I think I will stand in front of this rather than, than shout. I sat in the back of the room for a reading on Sunday and realized how hard it is to hear back there. Can you hear me okay, though, now? Okay. Fabulous. Fabulous. Uh, Ginny's, Ginny's giving you a handout that I probably will not refer to. At, I, I might, but don't panic when you see how long it is. It, it just contains a lot more examples of the things I'm going to be talking about for the most part. And the thing I want to talk about is, is this problem so huge and obvious and intractable that writers almost never talk about it. And that is the problem of crafting an opening to a piece of writing. I like following Brian um, on Sorry. endings. Now you can write an ending. <laughs> The problem of opening a piece of writing. Can you hear me? Does this mic is this mic on? Isn't that putting it close to that your mouth? Which one is it? Is it this yeah, one? It's this one. I, I thought it was this one. <laughs> I'm just gonna move that one out of the way. Okay. Uh, if you didn't get enough coffee and you really just want to sleep through this talk, the Cliff's notes. <laughs> Here they are. One, get the reader's attention. To keep it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Just a couple of caveats about this talk. I, I realize, of course, that the problem of crafting an opening, like the problem of crafting an ending, is inseparable from the problem of what goes in the middle. The opening has to, of course, hint at the meanings, emotions, motifs, complexities, and depths that characterize the whole. And the whole has to be of a piece, stylistically and tonally, with the opening. Also, the, prob the thing I want to talk about is opening, which is a, a distinctly different problem from starting. Um, we can talk about starting if you want to, but um, they're very different. There's lots of great advice out there, actually, about getting started. Um, my favorite is, is Annie Dillard's. She just says, uh, don't spend very much time on the first draft of, draft of the opening. Uh, you'll probably have to tear up the runway later. It helped you get airborne, but you, uh, you won't need it after you're there. The third one, uh, this may be the tough one for some of you. I, I write nonfiction, so I'm going to use nonfiction examples. I do think that the problem doesn't differ all that much across genres. Maybe you can tell me if I'm wrong, but all my examples come from, from nonfiction. It seems worthwhile at the beginning to come at this problem, both, both from the perspective of a reader and as a writer, because of course we're all readers too. As, and, and as readers, when we encounter a new piece of writing that we are not required by our teachers to read, that we, we have the choice of reading or not, I, I think that we are often I love this. I love giving talks and speaking in the plural, first person, we. <laughs> we. We are caught between the tug of the real world. Job, children, laundry, cooking, bills, email, student news, TV, and the tug of text. We love text, but we hover there on the brink in that liminal space, caught between the heat and noise and messiness of our real lives and the orderly, cloistered silence of an imagined world. Our real lives are work, but so is reading. <laughs> when we begin reading, writes Sven Burkertz, we expend an enormous energy. Only part of this goes toward understanding character, setting, and the details of the situation. And this is what seems really smart about what he says. The rest represents an energy of erasure, a self-silencing. We suspend our sense of the world at large, bracket it off, in order that the author's implicit world may declare itself. There are lots of things, of course, that make it likely that we'll, we'll do this work, um, even before we get to the first line. Um, these will seem obvious to you as well. <laughs> Familiarity with the author, with the journal in which the piece of writing appears, with the genre, reviews, friends' recommendations, a sense that you cannot 
possibly get caught out at the next faculty party with nothing to say about Jonathan Franzen's new novel. <laughs> I still have nothing to say about Jonathan Franzen's new novel. What do we want from the moment that we cross the threshold from the real world to the imagined? I think, I think again, I love this royal we. What we want <laughs> is from a book is what we want, it seems to me, from encounters with other people. And that's, of course, what, uh, what reading is, an encounter between the mind of the reader and the mind of the writer. We want to be charmed, flattered, seduced, entertained, educated. We want, in Saki's phrase, romance at short notice. Sometimes we want things that we should not necessarily want, it seems to me. Technology, of course, the bugaboo, has increased the speed and frequency of all of our interactions and decreased the quality and depth of them. It's made us want quick, if not instant, gratification. I'm not sure what to do about this, really, except maybe to, to keep reading. Um, even past the first moments of difficulty to give writers a bit more time. Um, I remind myself, I think, that the, the best, most nurturing and enduring friendships are never the ones that you form instantly on moving to a new place or starting a new job. They're, they're the ones that take longer. As writers, what is this problem? Uh, we have to overcome the reader's inertia, of course, just talked about that, Newton's law, bodies <coughs> at rest want to stay at rest. Um, I think we have to give the reader something pleasurable fairly quickly, whether it's at the level of voice, language, character, action, setting, some combination of these things. Um, I think that to, we have to grasp intuitively what readers want and what they need, even if they themselves have no idea what those things are. It's a list, I think, that suggests that writers have to be uh, stand-up comedians, contortionists, therapists, mother, lover, priest, stripper, and that I think that's actually about right when it comes to crafting an opening. Uh, I, what I'm going to say next is, is um, me, I, I, I'm going to talk for just a minute about the, the ways uh, that we go wrong, we, we go wrong sometimes as writers in openings. Um, and I have some examples that I'm really just gonna, gonna glance at. And, and I'm, um, I'm a taxonomist at heart. I really, I, I like categorizing things. So I put these examples into categories that are very specious and very fluid and, and really will not hold up to cro close scrutiny. So do me a favor and don't scrutinize them too closely because they're making me happy as they are now <laughs> as <laughs> categories. I'm liking them. Where we go wrong, in nonfiction, I think, especially in the opening, uh, uh, writers tend to abuse the first person singular. They take, they, they, they take for granted that the reader is already hooked from the moment that, that the, the reader gets to the piece. They, they think that just by saying I, I, people will want to, to listen to them. In another essay, Annie Dillard says, just because you're writing nonfiction doesn't mean you can hang on the reader like, you know, like somebody you're stuck next to in an airplane who wants to tell you the story of their life. This happens because I think that people are accustomed to, to two types of readers. One is their mother, who loves everything that they write, no matter what. So as soon as you say I to your mother, of course, your mother says that's wonderful. And also t <laughs> teachers, you know, teacher who assigned this piece of writing and is therefore professionally obligated to read it all the way through the, to the end. So this means that if you teach nonfiction in college, you see a lot of essays that begin um, with the alarm, the, there's the alarm clock opening. My alarm clock rings at six o'clock and I, yeah, <laughs> Jennifer's nodding, yes. Here's another one. This one makes me insane. There are students in the room who've heard me say, if you write this opening, I will kill you. The clock says 3.11 a.m. and here I am, still sitting at my computer, trying to figure out what to say in this essay that Professor Bryce wants in five hours. <laughs> I hate those openings, really, really hate those openings. <laughs> But there are ways to, f to do this right, to write an opening that's about writing the essay. Here's Nancy Mayers on being a cripple. 
The other day I was thinking of writing an essay on being a cripple. I was thinking hard in one of the stalls in the women's room in my office building as I was shoving my shirt into my jeans and tugging up my zipper. Preoccupied, I flushed, picked up my book bag, took my cane down from the hook and unlatched the door. So many movements unbalanced me, and as I pulled the door open, I fell over backward, landing fully clothed on the toilet seat with my legs splayed in front of me, the old beetle on its back routine. Saturday afternoon, the building deserted. I was free to laugh aloud as I wriggled back to my feet, my voice bouncing off the yellowish tiles from all directions. Had anyone been there with me, I'd have been still and faint and hot with chagrin. I decided it was high time to write that essay. So you can do it well. Um, another way that, that, that writers go wrong, I think, is that they, um, again, thinking of the teacher, they confuse the project of a creative piece with the project of an academic one, and they write an introduction instead of an opening. So they essentially lay out everything. It's a sort of template for all that's going to follow. They tell you what they're going to say before they say it. That's uh, just a mistake. Also, uh, thinking of their fifth grade teacher, sometimes writers follow certain rules that are infinitely breakable. You can, of course, begin an essay with I, with and, with but. You can begin with a fragment. You can begin with a quote. You can begin with a line of dialogue. It's amazing how many people were told they could never do any of these things. Here's the opening line of, a, of an essay written by a student of mine, uh, of a hockey player who turned out to be a, a really great writer a couple of years ago. Uh, this is a quote from his uncle. There has to be twins inside your head because there's no way one man can be that stupid. <laughs> <laughs> it's, great it's a great opening. <laughs> Uh, sometimes we, I should just talk about we. we, we go wrong. I too have gone terribly, terribly wrong here. We have an honorable impulse to begin with setting, time and or place, but we go to the most obvious, banal and cliched place. I was leaving for London in five days. It's just, it's no good. You can fix that a little bit. I was leaving for London in five days when I realized that my passport would expire in six. That's add a little tension to it. Writing a memoir, they begin at the beginning with the date and time of their birth. Brian touched on this um, yesterday. Uh, I was born February 11th, 1963 in Fairbanks, Alaska. Full stop. That is a very, very dull opening. Um, I can make it a little better. I can think of a couple of ways to make it better. I was born February 11th, 1963 in Fairbanks, Alaska, a few hours after Sylvia Plath killed herself in Primrose Hill, London. Or, here's, here's the beginning of an essay that Peter keeps telling me I need to write, and I haven't written it yet. I was born on February 11th, 1963, one year to the day before Sarah Palin was born. <laughs> a, fact, a fact that has shaken my faith in astrology. <laughs> uh, we offer weather reports. We think, you know, you got to know the weather before you can, can, can move on into the piece. Here's a student opening. My roommate and I stand outside the elephant house on a sunny but cool day. I mean, it's, it's, it's not, I've seen worse. The elephant house is nice, at least the elephant house. Is, is promising, right? You want to go into the elephant house, but if I don't know who you are, why should I care that you're there with your roommate? I don't know who your roommate is either, and sunny but cool is just not very interesting. Um, you know, weather. Wh weather, it's, it's like children. <laughs> your own is very interesting. Other people's, not so much. Here's <laughs> Here's Cynthia Ozick opening the shock of teapots. This, this is one of the great, great openings. One morning in Stockholm, after rain and just before November, a mysteriously translucent shadow <coughs> began to paint itself across the top of the city. So you can write weather. You just have to write weather beautifully. Um, <coughs> lastly, it seems to me that 
And th it's not really last. I'm sure there are many other ways to go wrong, but we <coughs> go wrong by forgetting that the reader needs that, needs a treat, needs a reward. We're like, we're like, you know, Pavlov's dogs. We just need something fast. It can come at the level of character, image, dilemma, action, voice, dialogue, anything, but it has to be there. Here's another student opening. These students, I know some students are in the room, some of my students. These are all from students who are long gone. They're not yours, I promise. <laughs> Once upon a time, you were born. <laughs> a cliche is not a treat, nor is the obvious a treat. And that is a line that manages to combine both the cliche and the obvious. You were born once upon a time. It's it's a it's a weak attempt at irony, and irony is irony is very very tricky to pull off in an opening line. Um, you can do it, but you know you just you always run the risk that somebody somebody somewhere will always not get it. Um, here are two great writers who do pull it off in the opening line. No one perhaps has ever felt passionately toward a lead pencil. Anybody know who that is? Jane's not here. That's Virginia Woolf. Uh, you'll know who this is. In Mulamine, in Lower Burma, I was hated by large numbers of people. The only time in my life that I have been important enough for this to happen. Shooting an elephant, yeah. <laughs> yeah, George Orwell. Okay, so that's my, that's my list of <coughs> ways that we can go wrong. I make... I, I watch the time. I get, gave you this, I love this James Thurber opening to Snapshot of a Dog. And I, I may come back to it and we could read it together and talk about what he, what he accomplishes in, in, this, in this long, long opening. I think maybe that is my plan to do that at the end. Um, again, you've got these examples. They, and I'm not going to read any of the ones that you've got. And I'm only going to give you really brief citations for the ones that I do read. If, if something really intrigues you, if you want to read the rest of the piece, just ask me and I'll tell you uh, where you can find it. Um, also, I, uh, before I get to these examples, I, I, I know that opening is a, is a total judgment call. It, it, how it may take me one sentence to get hooked where it takes you three, and vice versa. So I'm just reading into these pieces as deeply as I needed to read to get hooked myself. I hope it's far enough um, for you as well. Um, so here's my, here's my taxonomy, <laughs> about which I'm very happy. Voice. I'm starting here because it's the most important thing, especially in nonfiction where the narrator and the author are always the same person. Um, the hallmark of the personal essay, says Philip Lopate, is that the writer seems to be speaking directly into your ear. It's int intimacy, confiding everything from gossip to wisdom. So you've got to, in the, in the very opening of a piece of nonfiction, it, it's re it really, it's, it's not about how dramatic I can be. You know, the, the fact that I was born the same day Sylvia Plath killed herself. It, it's mildly interesting, but it's, it's it, it, it's really, I think, the voice that that makes you want to keep going. Not the not the information, not the setup, not the character, not not the weather, nothing nothing else. It's do I do I want to spend the next half hour of my life listening to this person speaking in my <coughs> ear? To read an essay or a memoir is is of course to to discover how the world comes at other people, and and a huge amount of that is conveyed. Um, in, in voice, in, in nonfiction. Just, just uh, three quick examples of openings. These are, these are three voices that I would go absolutely anywhere with. Um, I would walk away from this podium to go follow one of these people and, and read the rest of the piece, probably. Every year, I bury a couple hundred of my townspeople. Allison. <laughs> Thomas Lynch and the Undertaking. Uh, babies, babies, babies. There's a plague of babies. <laughs> Anyone? That's Joy Williams, The Case Against Babies. Great title. <laughs> Here, I love this one. Anybody who grows up in the South may have to reckon sometime or another with being born again. That's Shirley Abbott, that old time religion. 
time. You can begin with time, of course, as Brian said yesterday, uh, almost no contemporary literature, fiction or nonfiction, begins at the chronological beginning and ends at the chronological end and progresses in between in a linear way. Pieces travel through time, begin in media race, uh, mid-scene, mid-thought, mid-act. They snatch up past and present and tangle them all up. Um, you know, it's, it's playing with time is a matter of craft and, 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 and canniness. Um, I think I'll just give you some examples. Time, by the way, I, w I want to say when, I'm, when I think about time in the opening, I'm not just talking about the year, month, and date, and writer's age, although these things matter, of course, but, uh, but also sort of verb tense. If somebody is writing in the past tense, of course, you realize that they're, they're talking about something that happened in the past, which makes you aware that there's, there's a present that is different from that past. You, by, by beginning in the past tense, you get that doubleness on the page. Um, instantly. A actually, this Thurber is, a, Thurber is a good example. I ran across a dim photograph of him the other day going through some old things. He's been dead 25 years. His name was Rex. Um, you've got a double timeline there right, right away in the opening. Here I am looking through old photographs and I find one of this dog who's been dead 25 years and then he starts, he moves into the, you know, his childhood, the time when he had this dog. Um, and uh, this doubleness, of course, is, 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 is not just about time, it's about the, the, the double self. That's what a, an, an essayist or me memoirist does instantly, is to, to establish the, the self that experienced the things that he or she is writing about and the, the self that is now reflecting, um, scrutinizing. And, and writing about those events. A an opening that emphasizes time establishes not only the connection between these, these twin selves, but also, of course, the, the gap between them. Um, I used to be able to think, is the opening of Floyd Sklut's memoir, In the Shadow of Memory, about a traumatic um, brain injury. I used to be able to think. That gets that, you know, once, once I was a man who could think, now I'm a writer. And so instantly, right, this, this creates a sort of conundrum or paradox in our minds. You used to be able to think, now you can't think, but you're writing, you've written this whole, whole book. So I think you want to keep going to find out how he could do that. When I was a boy, my father had horses, over a hundred of them. Some of them rank, and I sat them well. Mark Sprague at the opening of Where Rivers Change Direction. It's that note of elegy. When I was a boy, my father had horses. So the rhythm of that is just beautiful. Uh, here's a rough one. Years later, when I was 26, she said in the New York Times that you would tie her naked and spread eagled on the bed that you would take a bat to her. She said you'd hit her for any reason. But in Haverhill, Massachusetts, you were my best friend, my brothers too. I was 15 and you two were 14. And in 1974, we walked the avenues on cold gray days, picking through dumps dumpsters for something to beat off to. That's Andre Debut, Tracks and Ties. That's, that's an opening that moves. All, look at all those moves in town. Years later, I'm 26. Sh it, I read in the New York Times. But way back in Haverhill, Massachusetts, when I was 15 and you were 14 in 1974, it's a lot of moves through time in just, just a few compressed sentences. Oh, here's my favorite. And this one, this is why these categories don't work. This is an opening where time and place are inextricable. Uh, you will know what this is. One summer, Along about 1904, my father rented a camp on a lake in Maine and took us all there for the month of August. E. Yeah, E.B. White, one, once more to the lake. It's a wonderful, it's a wonderful moment where he, I mean, he's doing such wonderful things there with both time and setting and also voice. Along about 1904, not in 1974, I was 14, you were 15, we picked through dumpsters in Haverhill, Massachusetts, but you know right away that this is a guy who's, who's writing about memory, along about 1904, and the memory may not be all that precise, right? He's 
telling you huge amounts of, he, giving you a huge amount of information there. Place, to emphasize place in the opening, it seems to me, is to signal very strongly to the reader that place is probably a, a central, central character even in what follows. Uh, the level of detail conveys not just the vividness of memory, but also the strength of your attachment. Again, past tense suggests the story will unfold in memory and is perhaps this going to be the story of how the writer came to leave this place. I had a farm in Africa at the foot of the Nagong Hills. The equator runs across these highlands a hundred miles to the north, and the farm lay at an altitude of over 6,000 feet. Yeah, <laughs> of course. Um, present tense description on place, on the other hand, tends to offer up some sense often of contrast or surprise or tension between what appears uh, to be and, and what, what one expects to be. It can reveal a lot about the writer's sort of patterns and powers of, of observation. Is he or she the sort of person who sees what's, what's front and center and obvious or what's sort of peripheral off to the side as so many writers do? Um, is the place evoked not just with the eyes, but with the other senses. Here's the opening to Joanne Beard's very short essay. The family vacation. Heat, flies, sand, and dirt. My mother sweeps and complains. My father forever baits hooks and untangles lines. Seen, seen, seen in the sense not, not of setting, but of, but of but of action, of movement, of setting people in, in um, together, putting people together. <laughs> so very articulate. As openings go, these have, these have great momentum. They're, they're like film, of course, with image, pairing image and action, dialogue, character. The moment at the beginning may form part of the larger narrative. Um, of the of the whole essay or or book, or it may just be a, a kind of anecdote, um, but it can be, it becomes the opening scene, sort of like the um, a, a note that you hold. Amy, it's is it sostenuto pedal, right? The middle pedal on the piano. <laughs> Tell, talking to Carrie last night, she said, "I've never heard of that." But I don't. It's is it the one that holds a note for the whole time until you let up on the pedal? Somebody else? It's the sostenuto pedal, right? Sostenuto. Yeah. That's like doing that. <laughs> that was a lot of work for one metaphor. Um, uh, if there's danger here in this opening, a sense, a sense of you know, danger, then probably there's, there's going to be danger throughout. So this can be a very appealing opening, especially if you're a reader in the mood for danger. Um, and if your life is fairly prosaic, then, then, then it's nice to have danger in literature. Our car boiled over again just after my mother and I crossed the continental divide. While we were waiting for it to cool, we heard from somewhere above us the bawling of an air horn. The sound got louder, and then a big truck came around the corner and shot past us into the next curve, its trailer shimmying wildly. Oh, Toby, my mother said, he's lost his brakes. This is not like, this is turning into a test. Does anybody know? <laughs> this Boy's Life, yeah, by Tobias Wolf. Uh, it's, a, it's a really, really pretty fabulous opening scene, of course. How can you not read the next paragraph? <laughs> <laughs> he's lost his brakes. Information. Because people neither read nor write creative nonfiction in order to impart or gain information, an opening that offers information is often, though not always, of course, an ironic opening. Um, the form is often familiar, instructions, pamphlet, recipe, resume, but some signal delivered in fairly short order signals to the reader that this is not, this is not a piece of journalism. Um, Here's the opening to David Foster Wallace's Big Red Sun. The American Academy of Emergency Medicine confirms it. Each year, between one and two dozen adult US males are admitted to ERs after having castrated themselves. With kitchen tools, usually, sometimes wire cutters. In answer to the obvious question, 
Surviving patients most often report that their sexual urges had become an intolerable source of in, in, uh, had become a source of intolerable conflict and anxiety. Uh, you may not have thought you needed to know that, but you know, at, you keep reading. You think, actually, I do need to know this, so I'll keep I'll keep reading. The sweeping generalization. You see these less in nonfiction than in fiction. I think uh, 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 that's a, actually a really interesting question that I won't dwell on at this moment. You know, why can Tolstoy get away with that? All happy families are alike. All unhappy families um, are different in their unhappiness. And and Jane Austen, what it's a truth universally acknowledged that a. Yeah, large portion of the world. Thank you very much. <laughs> But mm -hmm. nonfiction writers almost never do it. I, th I, think what it, what it, I think that they're aware that their writers are, their readers are afraid that you're going to stay in that mode the whole time, whereas you see an opening like that line like that in fiction, and you, you know that the, the writer won't stay there, right? But it's dangerous, but you, you, you can do it. Um, you can do it, it seems to me, mainly by moving pretty swiftly away from generalization toward the concrete. And, and specific. Sometimes uh, the loftiness of a generalization can be paired with the sort of comic smallness of the example. There is a mistaken idea, ancient but still with us, that an overdose of anything from fornication to hot chocolate will teach restraint by the very results of its abuse. It's MFK Fisher, uh, once a tramp, but that, that, you know, hot chocolate and fornication uh, uh, make, make that generalization work, plus anything that she writes works, of course. Um, sometimes an, uh, the idea or aphorism or generalization carries the sort of, again, the unmistakable stamp of the, the writer's voice. The, the voice is so powerful, so individual, that in, in, the, in the very construction of the mm -hmm. sentence, the general and the, and the particular are paired. Those of us who would be suicides come at odd bits of knowledge about the failings of the human heart. That's Nancy Mayer's I'm Touching by Accident. Surprise, just a little bit on surprise. Um, not, and I'm not talking about humor. Some of these are so funny. I don't, the humor is not a category in itself. There's, it, it's, it's in all of these others. Humor, of course, always surprises or else it wouldn't be funny. Um, but, I, but I'm thinking about uh, formal surprise, sort of abru abrupt changes in, in discourse, in rhetorical mode, and even in typeface or point of view. Um, these are, I think of these as the sort of big easy chair openings where they, it looks like there's a really comfortable chair there and you, you're holding your cappuccino and you're, you're just about to sit down and somebody, of course, pulls it out from under you. It, 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 that's a real trick as a writer to pull off because you want the reader who's like sitting there on the floor with her spilled cappuccino all over her white blouse. You want her to stay <laughs> and keep keep reading. So again, you have to you have to offer reward pretty quickly. Um, the easiest way to write a personal essay is to use the standard form taught in Composition 101, an introductory paragraph followed by three paragraphs outlining three main points and a final summary paragraph. But instead of just blathering about yourself, describe vivid scenes and what they mean to you, such as when your two-year-old son Jordan solemnly declares from the bathtub, I can't swim, my penis is hard. And you tell him, it's OK, it's normal, knowing it'll subside and he'll be able to swim soon. But you don't tell him that the teeny little weenie he's holding will be the source of the most intense worries, sorrows, and pleasures he'll ever experience. And you wonder if you'll ever be able to tell him the truth. <laughs> That's Stanton Michaels, How to Write a Personal Essay. <laughs> Reverse psychology. This is. These are these are the odd odd openings, and, and that there's reverse psychology in those as well. I mean, you really you have to, you know, you, it's hard to get past that first sentence of how to write a personal essay. It seems to me, but uh, uh, other openings create barriers. It seems to me at the very same time they cr they create entrances. Another another paradox: the the author sets up a hurdle or even lots of hurdles. The opening to one of my favorite books, a book that I never, ever, ever lose an opportunity to talk about, uh, James Agee and Walker Evans's 
Let us now praise famous men. Begins with Evans's photographs, then a preface, a foreword, an introduction, a cast of characters, and um, half a dozen epigraphs. And then when you finally get to it, the opening is a, is a sort of blast of anger, but essentially says, uh, who the hell are you and what are you doing here? Uh, I think this is actually in the, the handout I gave you. I spoke of this piece, th this work we were doing is curious, and I had better amplify this. It seems to me curious not to say obscene and thoroughly terrifying that it could occur to an association of human beings drawn together through need and chance and for profit into a company, an organ of journalism, to pry intimately into the lives of an undefended and appallingly damaged group of human beings, an ignorant and helpless rural family, for the purpose of parading the nakedness, disadvantage, and humiliation of these lives before another group of human beings in the name of science, of honest journalism, of humanity, of social fearlessness, for money, and for a reputation for crusading and for unbiased, which when skillfully enough qualified is exchangeable at any bank for money, and it, it goes on and on. It's just, you know, he says, what the hell are you doing here? What the hell am I doing here? Why are we both here? It's, it's a, it's one of those really, it, it's, it's, a, it's, maybe you all can explain this to me. It's an appealing hurdle. You think, okay, this guy doesn't even think he should be writing this book, and he definitely thinks I shouldn't be reading this book. So it works for me. I'm just, I'm great. <laughs> <laughs> These tricks really work for me, so of course I want to keep reading to find out why, why he wrote it and why, in fact, I am reading it. Uh, here's another one. I don't want to talk about me, of course, but it seems as though far too much attention has been lavished on you lately, <laughs> that your greed and vanities and quest, quest for self-fulfillment have been catered to far too much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know who that is? <laughs> that's, that's, that's Joy Williams. I love Joy Williams. She also wrote The Case Against Babies. Save the Whales, Screw the Shrimp. This is great. And what am I doing on time? I'm actually really close to the end, so I, I, wish, I wish I'd brought this book up here. A Amy Brown and I were talking in my office a couple of weeks ago about this talk, and I, I had about two ideas of things that I could say, and I was feeling, I was feeling pretty nervous. Um, so I, I, I told her my two ideas, and I said, do you have any ideas? And she said, not right now. Um, and then about three days later, she sent me this long and, and, and beautifully articulate email about um, this book, The Piano Shop on the Left Bank by Thad Carhart, if I got that right, which I instantly ordered and have not had the t chance to read in full. But, but very... Amy, help me if I don't get this right, okay? He walks past this shop day after day after day um, that, that has just pieces of pianos in the windows. And, and after a while, he's really, really intrigued about what's, what that shop is, what's going on in that shop. It does say something, piano pieces, I think it says. So eventually he, he, he knocks and he goes in and essentially the owner of the shops, and he says, maybe, he started, maybe, maybe I'd like to buy a used piano, he says. And the owner of the shop says, I have no used pianos, but Carhartt knows there are used pianos. There are lots of used pianos. And he does this several times. He keeps going in, and the owner keeps saying, no, I can't help you. I have no, I have no used pianos, but I'll, I'll keep my eye out for you. And then eventually, Carhartt bumps into an assistant in the shop who's, who's more helpful. And he says, how come you guys won't sell me a, a piano? Now, now, what's really wonderful about this opening is now he really wants a piano. He didn't really want a piano. <laughs> All the, he's walking past this shop day after day after day. He stops in on a lark to see what it is. And now, now that he can't buy a used piano in a store that he knows sells used pianos, he's dying for a used piano. He wants, he wants a Steinway Grand Piano. He's going to start playing again. It's, he's, it's, it's the only thing he can think about. And this assistant says to him, we can't sell you a used piano unless you have an introduction from somebody who's already bought a piano from us. So then Carhartt's mission becomes... This, is, this obsession becomes finding somebody who has a piano from this shop who can serve as his. So it's it's a, it's a, I'm I'm telling I'm not telling it as succinctly as, as I ought to. It's a it's a 
it's a marvelous memoir, but it's a wonderful metaphor, it seems to me, for, for what happens to us when we're presented with difficulty. We want, we want to overcome difficulty. We, we try harder than if um, something does not appear to be, to be difficult. If I got that about right, you've read the whole thing. And it delivers right on the promise of that opening. Yeah. Uh, just a couple of other categories. The uncanny, that's that old saw that literature makes the strange familiar and the familiar strange. Uncanny moments are moments when everyday life suddenly takes on a sort of literary or fictive quality. And I, I think you get a lot of mileage out of beginning with, with such a moment, with a moment of sort of disjunction or disturbance. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a destabilizing opening. And I think that as readers, the other people have studied this more scientifically than I have. Mm -hmm. as, as readers, it, 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 we, we, we start leaning. We think, OK, eventually stability and order will be, will be restored. So we, we keep reading um, to find out when, when that will happen, when, when, when stability will reassert itself. Here's the opening to Lauren Slater's memoir, Lying. The summer I turned 10, I smelled jasmine everywhere I went. At first, I thought the smell was part of the normal world because we were having a hot spell that July, and every night it rained and the flowers were in full bloom. So I didn't pay much attention, except after a while I noticed I smelled jasmine in the bath and my dreams were full of it. And when one day I cut my palm on a piece of glass, my blood itself was scented, and I started to feel scared and also good. Um, titles, this is my last category, titles. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty interested actually in the way that titles can work with openings. A good title by itself, of course, can pique interest, but in concert with an opening, it can, it can create, again, just a, just a huge amount of, of energy for, for liftoff, um, creating a kind of question or kindling some suspense. Um, here's Joseph Brodsky in praise of boredom. It's like, I mean, how can you not read what comes below in praise of boredom? A substantial part, it's a, it's a graduation talk that he gave at Dartmouth. A substantial part of what lies ahead of you is going to be claimed by boredom. The reason I'd like to talk to you about it today on this lofty occasion is that I believe no liberal arts college prepares you for that eventuality. <laughs> <laughs> a title can, in concert with the opening, create a metaphor. Uh, here's Mary Clearman Blue. The title is The Art of Memoir. One of the oldest and loveliest of quilt patterns is the double wedding ring in which bands of color lock and interlock in endless circles. If you want to make a double wedding ring quilt, be a saver of fabric. Treasure the smallest scraps from the maternity dress you've just sewn for your oldest daughter or the Halloween costume you cobbled together for your youngest from the unfaded inside hems of worn out clothing or the cotton left over from other quilts. She doesn't talk about memoir writing, actually, for a couple more pages, just quilt making. It's really lovely. Titles can also, it seems to me, in concert with the opening line, create a, a, the prose equivalent of, of enjambment, you know, that sort of that breaking of a syntactical unit that poets get by, with line breaks. Um, so here's, here's my last example. The title of this essay by Anne Hodgman is no wonder they call me a bitch. Does anybody know the opening line of that essay? I've always wondered about dog food. <laughs> to spend a week eating dog food to see, see what it really tasted like, whether there was truth in the advertising side. No wonder they call me a bitch. Um, <laughs> and that, you know, we could, we could do questions, we could break early for coffee, we could look at more at James Thurber's fabulous opening. I'm, I'm open. <laughs> yes? Uh, one of the things I found out that helps me if I'm having trouble with an opening is I write a letter to a friend and tell him I'm having trouble with the opening. Uh -huh. Then I get the opening. <laughs> yeah. And then you delete right. what you wrote to your friend? Yeah. That's great. John? 
well on your question of why fiction writers can get away with sweeping generalities more, you know? more, more deftly. Yeah. And I think, I think about that a lot because I often use the, the Anna Kay opening as an example to students that you can say all sorts of crazy bullshit yeah. and people will sort of say, will accept it in fiction. Yeah. I think yeah. one thing a fiction writer has to do is the, the narrative voice, the, the narrator of an essay is not an artificial construct. Or right. It is, but it presents it, it's itself a persona. as a, a real right. person. Right? It's created, but it's you. Right. Yeah. But the, but the, um, the narrative voice of uh, a work of fiction is yeah. sort of an elaborate um, uh, you know, artifice. And it so is. it has to introduce itself mm -hmm. and tell you what kind of story, what kind of frame of reference the story is going to be, is going to be dropped That's into. Right. So you know, and the, another example I often use in my um, workshops is the way George Saunders in his story Sea Oak can get away with the you know the ant dying and then rising from the dead and reading people's minds. It's and the reason you can he can do that in this story is because in the first paragraph he presents a kind of antic way of talking that establishes the story as the kind of story in which impossible okay. things. Well, you happen. did that last night. That's What's that? What, your story did that last night. Pretty yeah, early yeah, on. Okay, Always. sure. Yeah, this, this is an issue. It signals. But well, I feel like with this whole story, he's, he's essentially saying, you know, reader, I am this kind of narrator. Yeah, this is who I am. Also, uh, Amy, Amy Brown did, did for me a couple of weeks ago a, a task that, that seemed to have absolutely uh, no no purpose in the world, I'm sure, to her, and I'm not sure if I'll ever use it, but I, um, that whole storyline is so interesting to me that I, I, I set her the task. Do <laughs> you want to say what you had to do? <laughs> I had to go through Anna and see how much of the story was focused on Kitty versus Anna. And it ended up being pretty close to even a little bit more about Kitty. Yeah, we don't, we don't realize this. He, he, Tolstoy's narrator, is, he's, he's, he seems absolutely reliable when he says that at the beginning, but the book is a, is a proof. It's a, it's a proof that he's wrong. It undermines the whole statement. More than half of Anna Karenina is devoted to the story of Kitty and Levin, um, the, not the story of Anna and Vronsky. Interesting. Yeah, you're right. Whereas when you when you make a generalization at the beginning of a piece of nonfiction, you, it's it's got to be you. It's got to hold yeah. up. And your and your yeah. readers is is you know there's a danger that your readers just gonna say oh yeah yeah exactly <laughs> says you <laughs> and go away immediately. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Others? Yes. Three um, things that you mentioned were like. When I was a boy, the summer I turned 10, mm -hmm. when I was a boy, and, and it just seems like that's kind of breaking a rule that you shouldn't have, but what, I guess what carries it maybe is the voice, or what comes after, or the fact that these are really good writers, and so anything they say after when I was a boy would be a gem, mm -hmm. as opposed to... It you know, has to be, me. yeah. That's a poetic line. When I was a boy, my father had horses and horses, hundreds of them, and I sat them well. I mean, I, I'm reading it like, but it's mm -hmm. it's got the, the, the fabulous rhythm that kind of belies the, the ordinariness of that of that opening. But it does it does on the face of it seem like an opening you shouldn't be able to get away with. Yeah, it does seem like the average, right? Yeah. You have to be really careful. Yeah. Well, here's a question for you. How how long do you give a writer? Does it de it depends like on time of day and how much coffee you've had. And <laughs> yeah, but but really, how long will you give somebody? New York Times, just one sentence. One sentence. <laughs> yeah. 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 Jennifer, the problem is similar yeah. and even amplified with the lyric poem, yeah. where the persona presents itself with intimacy. Mm -hmm. It is constructed, I'm always reminding my <coughs> colleagues and students, but it is an intimate eye. Yeah. And it often you know, it can't it can't afford any generality. Yeah. And yeah. it has to have a kind of <coughs> neck breaking energy. Yeah. 
or I don't think the reader is it. Yeah. March. And the poem is a shorter animal. Yeah. So I think what you're saying is that I'm going to certainly bring it into our workshop this morning and keep talking about that issue. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's, <laughs> it's very pertinent to the poem. Yeah. But a lot of poets do that. You know, it's not in jam when you have something going on between the title and the first line, or is it? It can be. Sometimes a, a, a title will um, be an opening line. Yeah, yeah. Um, and sometimes poets repeat the title in the opening line. It's possible. Seems a, a, a sort of counterintuitive move then, that often works. Sometimes. I mean, yeah. I think it's hard yeah. to make yeah. it work. Hard. Yeah, yeah. I think of your opening, I may have flunked physics, right? That's, that is yeah. the opening line, right? That's the opening line. Yeah, yeah. Or not the time. No, I know. I was just thinking that's, that's an opening line that gets you a lot of momentum, it seems to me. Okay. The confession. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very much. <laughs>